so good morning and welcome everyone to the uh, second week of the uh, statistical physics school uh, so this week uh, the first uh, lecturer is uh, shubhro bhattacharya from icts and he'll be talking about uh, topology in uh, uh, statistical physics so it's a great pleasure to uh, have shubhro and we are really grateful that he put uh, in all the trouble to organize this online lectures which is uh, which is really a lot of work uh so okay so uh, so we'll start now and uh, so basically uh, some uh, rules about uh, asking questions and so on uh so uh, so it's better if you kind of uh, uh, collect your questions and i think uh, uh shubhro will uh, like pause maybe every 10 minutes or so and you can ask all your questions together if there are really urgent questions uh, so there's an option to raise hands uh so you have to click on participants and then at the bottom of the uh, panel you'll see uh, there's an option to raise hands okay so you can raise hands and also you can ask questions in the chat uh, box so you can put your questions and then when uh, uh, when uh, shubhro takes a pause then you can ask uh, all the questions he will answer them uh, at one time maybe that's more efficient uh okay so we'll start uh, so shubhro so thank you abhishek uh, so uh, so you guys can hear me abhishek you can hear me right yeah okay good so great so it's an unusual format but uh, still it's a great pleasure to uh, be a part of this school i think that this uh, bangalore school that abhishek and sanjeev and others uh, organize is actually one of the best schools uh, certainly in our country and now reaching out uh, to uh, uh, the rest of the world uh, i wish there was a school like this when i was a graduate student um, so i hope that all of you are uh, uh, enjoying the school uh, unfortunately we have to be in this format otherwise you could have been in our nice campus um, from those who are outside the city yes so uh, uh, so what i'll do in the next five lectures is to uh, uh, introduce you to the basic of topological ideas uh, um, uh, in uh, physics uh, particularly in condensed matter and statistical physics and topology as you all know is a branch of mathematics and we would uh, try to see uh, some of it uh, uh, the application of those ideas uh, in context of specific areas of physics uh, which uh, the uh, hope is that uh, even though the applications that i'll show are specific applications they would contain general enough information Uh, that you uh, can uh, start thinking on your own about uh, these ideas okay so um, so i have a set of notes uh, that i don't know maybe, uh, if you have them uh, object uh, do they have my notes no uh, no i mean we have okay. not really shared so we'll okay. share it today so i'll uh, what i'll do then is basically uh, uh, i mean Uh, at the end of the, today's lecture maybe we can share today's notes so that uh, and then uh, do this every day uh, okay is that fine abhishek yeah okay good so uh, now that you have seen uh, the face behind his voice uh, i'll switch off my uh, video and basically start sharing my screen okay so uh okay so you can see my screen right abhishek uh, yes my, okay good so uh okay so so what i plan to do in the next few uh, uh, uh lectures is uh cover Uh, i mean basically five lectures is to cover various things and uh, this is the content of lecture 1 and but before we uh, uh, go to the actual physics content maybe i should uh, uh, tell a few things about uh, uh, about uh, what i uh, about the background and the mode of this lectures and uh, the particularly given this uh, uh, unusual uh, mode that i am lecturing 
okay so um, so what we uh, want to do is to understand a set of properties uh, of many body systems i'll uh, introduce these ideas uh, very carefully uh, let me just uh, not use this uh, yeah so many body systems uh, which invoke the ideas uh, of topology as we uh, said and uh, then it, uh, in the last 30 years particular and a uh, little more actually even though the uh, subject dates back quite a while uh, it has turned out that uh, these ideas have uh, wide ranging applications and uh, uh, it is becoming more and more important in the way that we think about uh, various uh, uh, issues about many body systems. Uh, uh, this is not only confined to, uh, say, uh, quantum many body, but also um, uh, things like uh, classical uh, systems and even electromagnetism, quantum and classical field theories, etc., etc. Uh, but, however, we uh, uh, usually do not learn this as a part of our mathematical physics uh, textbooks, the usual mathematical physics textbooks, at least the ones that I learned as an undergrad or master's uh, student. Uh, I don't know why, uh, but maybe uh, the, these books did, uh, were written at a time where uh, these, uh, the importance of these ideas were not completely appreciated. Uh, or maybe uh, uh, since these ideas, uh, the applications are too diverse, uh, maybe uh, it is difficult to introduce at a UG uh, uh, or master's level. I really don't know. But uh, what uh, uh, we are going to do is uh, try to fill up this uh, gap um, and uh, try to see uh, uh, what we can do. Uh, and this is... Uh, 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 what I'm uh, going to uh, try and understand. Okay, so uh, so uh, so you know that uh, typical uh, course in mathematics uh, or mathematical physics rather uh, says that uh, mathematical structures that we use as physicists, and I'm going to assume that we all are practicing physics, uh, so has two characteristic features. So so. It has a basic set of mathematical ideas, which are which might be inspired by physics, uh, but uh, are logically in, uh, independent and abstract. That's a mathematical structure, okay? And this uh, abstractness uh, uh, is uh, uh, the reason why mathematics uh, is powerful, so powerful, uh, and has application in diverse areas. And the proofs are rigorous. Um, I'm certainly not uh, far from being a rigorous mathematician, but um, if you open a mathematics paper or something, you would uh, see that uh, those proofs are certainly uh, much more rigorous than typical physics proofs uh, that uh, I'm more accustomed to. Okay, so once we have this mathematical structure, we would uh, uh, try to apply it to uh, different physics, non-physics settings, and we would be con uh, concerned with uh, different physics uh, settings. Uh, so, so this is the typical uh, structure. Uh, this is a typical uh, structure of mathematical physics course, but we would not be able to uh, do this. This would take us a semester and maybe more. Uh, and in fact, that is not the aim uh, of this uh, advanced school. So uh, the aim of this advanced school is that since we all are practicing physics and uh, hence we have some background knowledge uh, at quite an advanced level, uh, like the master's level uh, knowledge is quite advanced. Um, so we will try to build upon that, okay? And, uh, uh, and so that we can immediately start thinking about these ideas by, uh, from examples that we already know, okay? So, uh, so that's going to be the strategy that I'll take. Um, uh, and I guess this is the strategy of all short courses, all short advanced level courses that uh, we have all been part of. The, uh, okay, so, so, so on that note, I'll assume certain things, okay? Uh, so, so, uh, so just don't uh, get uh, too uh, uh, walked up. But what I'll uh, assume uh, is some ideas of elementary group theory, uh, finite and B groups, uh, vector spaces, complex analysis, 
uh, partial differential equations and integrals and functionals okay so so that does not mean that i'll uh, okay uh, on uh, the physics that's the mathematical side and on the physics side i'll assume basically uh, the basic uh, uh, structures of physics uh, that we know uh, classical mechanics quantum mechanics uh, some electrodynamics and statistical physics and particularly statistical physics i'll need at some advanced level uh, which uh, involves uh, the idea of phase transitions spontaneous symmetry breaking and randogisberg theory okay so uh, so these are the kind of things that i'll uh, be sort of using in this uh, uh, next uh, in this set of lectures uh, but this really does not mean that i'm going to assume that you are um, uh, you are going to be able to solve uh, every contour integral that i uh, write um, uh, which is a great thing and uh, but uh, uh, i'll not assume that uh, it's just that i'll assume that when i speak of these ideas uh, and do the relevant calculation you uh, are basically uh, familiar with these ideas so that you can understand the way that i speak okay and of course i'll give sufficient background uh, as far as possible uh, so that you understand these ideas and uh, to make uh, sure that you uh, are uh, with me okay and uh, if you don't then just ask okay as obishek pointed out every now and then i shall stop and uh, Uh, i'll try to accept your uh, questions and uh, try to uh, uh, answer them if i don't uh, know the answer i'll say and i'll try to find out the answer in the next class okay and uh, okay so um, so that's going to be the format of uh, doing things i'll uh, 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 okay so i so i intend to cover the following topics okay this does not mean that i have to cover there is no exam that we have to take after this course but um, it's good to have a syllabus uh, for uh, you and most importantly for me uh, to uh, make sure that i uh, am uh, giving you a focus set of uh, lectures uh, so that uh, uh, you can uh, you can benefit from it okay uh, because it's really a very vast area uh, of physics that we are talking about physics and mathematics okay so 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 what i would do is that today i'll start with this okay i'll show you an explicit uh, example of what is called a topological quantum number which can be completely worked out on the basics uh, on the basis of physics that we all know okay and whatever little we don't know uh, i'll work out okay um, i'll recap basically uh, uh, we all know uh, i'll just need to recap so then uh, given this explicit example which would be in context of electromagnetism that i'll work out i'll list a familiar uh, set of situations uh, that can arise and the mathematical generalizations of those ideas okay so so basically uh, this uh, uh, a and b uh, contains the main heart of the lecture okay and uh, so we should be uh, very careful that we understand uh, this uh, a the example and b the generalization of that example okay and then we are going to apply it to uh, particular situations at uh, the, uh, the situation of phase transition and spontaneous symmetry breaking is one context that i'll try to uh, uh, go over in great detail and uh, expand the ideas that i introduce uh, today and then uh, uh, more mathematical generalities would follow um, after that because we would need to generalize our uh, mathematical uh, mathematical language uh, so as to cover uh, various things okay and i'll then discuss a classic example of uh, these ideas which known as uh, which is known as the uh, berzinski costelis thaulis phase transition uh, mediated by vortices which are topological defects and 
uh, 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 the, and an uh, advanced form of the same statement, which goes under the name of XY duality, uh, this, uh, this last thing, XY duality, is um, mm, uh, something that I am extremely uh, uh, interested in. And um, uh, just the historical context, the person who uh, worked uh, some of this actually sits um, uh, roughly opposite to my office now, my colleague uh, Chandan Dasgupta. So Chandan and uh, Bert Halper in, in the 1970s, along with Peskin, worked out some of these dualities. And it has found out wide-ranging applications in quantum field theory. Uh, uh, and some of these ideas have been rejuvenated uh, over the last five to uh, ten years. Okay, so 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 then this. Uh, C, D, and E contains the first module of advanced version. And then if I get any time, and if uh, you are uh, free to express your interest, um, I'll uh, uh, cover one of these two topics. Uh, one is called the churn simons theory and the quantum Hall effect, which as uh, some of you might know, quantum Hall effect is a topological phase. And uh, the other, uh, the more uh, uh, interesting uh, thing and more uh, 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 generalized uh, thing is uh, something called the defect suppressed transition and deconfined criticality, uh, which also invokes the ideas of these topological defects and uh, in field theory. Okay, so that's the plan. So uh, this is more of a slide for me than you, but. Uh, in case uh, some of you are familiar with this, it's absolutely not uh, necessary. But in case you're uh, familiar with this, this is the outline that we are going to try and follow and see where, where uh, this takes us. Okay. So, okay. So, so, so uh, as I said, that the aim would be to uh, uh, tell you a story in a way that you can start thinking for yourself. And, uh, uh, and what I strongly encourage you is to not treat this set of lecture notes as a repository of to be learned knowledge, okay? Because in, you know, uh, in these days when we have uh, the computer memory is so cheap, uh, we have all our computers filled with lecture notes of one school and another. And uh, I certainly don't want, I, I uh, certainly don't have in mind uh, to um, uh, write an exhaustive set of lecture notes uh, so that you can just keep them and look them uh, the once in a while uh, to learn uh, uh, some things. On, on the contrary, what I'll, uh, I want you to uh, uh, be able to do is uh, uh, I mean, pick up the simplest context and start thinking. And whenever you uh, the hit a roadblock, you know what to look for okay so that's the aim okay and of course crucially uh, i'll assume that since i cannot see you which is very unfortunate uh, you all are paying uh, all your attention uh, in the next uh, one hour or so uh, in this uh, on the screen and even on this internet platform where there are uh, fantastic distractions okay Good. So as you might have already noticed that I'm almost reading out verbatim from these lecture notes. And the reason why I am doing this is that uh, I, uh, yeah, I don't know uh, the how uh, else to uh, be coherent uh, without uh, being in an actual classroom. Okay. Uh, and once in a while, I'll deviate uh, to, to a whiteboard. Okay. And uh, let me see if I try to, uh, if you can see this, okay? So, okay, so in this case, it's a blackboard. So let me see, topological quantum numbers, okay? Okay, so uh, uh, you can see this, right? Yeah. Okay, good. So, so this is basically, uh, yeah. Uh, what my initial uh, 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 set of comments are. Uh, so, okay, so let's see. Uh, okay, good. So, I'll... 
Okay, good. So uh, at this point, any questions uh, of how are we going to do things about anything? Okay, so since uh, there seems to be uh, no questions, let's start with the actual material. Okay, and uh, what we are going to do is to use classical electromagnetic theory to develop some of the ideas that we are uh, going to uh, we are going to need. Uh, so uh, uh, I have uh, uh, I think that this is the simplest setting uh, that we can use. Uh, partly uh, because of my uh, 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 because of uh, our association with classical electromagnetic theory and things like that, and uh, uh, I mean this is what I think. Okay, so so let's uh, start with the Maxwell's equation. By the way, um, uh, make sure that uh, you don't co uh, copy uh, the, if there uh, are typos in this. Uh, uh, formula, you uh, uh, point that out, and that's one way to keep yourself awake. Okay, so uh, so let's start with Maxwell's equation, and we have the uh, uh, Gauss's law, uh, the Faraday's law, the uh, zero divergence uh, for the magnetic field. This would be important for our context when uh, in a moment, and this is the uh, this is the Ampere's law. Okay, so. Uh, so this basically summarizes the uh, the, the behavior of electric charges um, and uh, electric charges and electric fields and the degrees of freedom that we are concerned with are basically electromagnetic fields E and B. Okay, sorry, just a moment. So uh, electromagnetic fields E and B, and then. We have the electric charges, uh, which is uh, and the currents rho and g. Okay, so so that's uh, those are the degrees of freedom, and Maxwell's equation actually captures the effect of the fields uh, due to the charges, and to understand the effect of the uh, effect of the field on the charges. Uh, we use Newton's laws, um, uh, some uh, dp dt uh, equal to f, where f is given by the L uh, Lorentz force equation, uh, things that we know. Okay, so things like this. Okay, so that's the kind of things that we uh, all know. Okay, now let's try to backtrack and understand some of the things that we all have thought. I just want to use those to introduce some of the concepts that I would like to use. And uh, while it might be uh, redundant uh, for most of you, uh, but uh, it is still good to uh, formulate things in a way that uh, it is coherent. Okay, so let's start with the absolute basics, the Coulomb's law for a point charge. Okay, at origin, and this is the electric field. Okay. And electric field is something which we can measure. So electric field is measurable. Okay. So now the question is that what happens at r equal to zero? Okay. If I take an electric field meter and uh, try to go uh, closer and closer to r equal to zero, this seems to suggest that I'll measure a uh, 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 reading which is uh, which is larger and larger, and it seems to blow up at r equal to zero. Okay, uh, so then uh, which way is the electric field at r equal to zero, and things like that, uh, things that we have uh, the one, uh, always wondered as uh, high school kids, etc. So the modern way of uh, understanding this is that this particular theory ceases to be a valid description at r equal to zero okay and we must look for a more general theory which addresses uh, these questions these type of questions and it boils down to maxwell's equation uh, within an appropriate appro approximation uh, which one can try to understand etc etc but the, uh, that's how we uh, 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 we explain this does not mean that 
this point charge really uh, is not a point charge or something like that. It's just that we cannot decide on this question within this uh, framework. Okay, so uh, so that's a very important statement. Okay, so uh, so this uh, I think in some form or the other took physicists a good part of fifty years to learn that uh, 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 this is a very important statement. Okay, and so 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 in this sense, uh, 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 Maxwell's equation describe a classical effective field theory. Uh, effective in the sense that uh, there, there is some other theory which is applicable uh, at very small distances, etc., uh, uh, of which the Maxwell theory uh, effectively, uh, uh, which effectively becomes Maxwell theory under the right conditions. Okay, and one can go and try to understand what is the structure of this quote-unquote fundamental, more fundamental theory. Uh, which applies even to maybe even to r equal to zero, and that's a valid pursuit. Okay, one can go ahead and do that. I don't know uh, the, what it means to be a, a more fundamental theory or not, but I mean the question is certainly valid. What happens to Maxwell's equation um, at uh, smaller uh, distances? And it is uh, a very important question uh, uh, of physics. And partly we know the answer, uh, partly we don't know. Okay. Okay, so 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 what instead what we want to do is to um, try and ask uh, how to make this effective field theory that we have the classical field theory Maxwell's equation uh, self consistent and, uh, and learn even within this approximation uh, and accommodate this seemingly nonsensical uh, result that the electric field blows up at r equal to zero. Okay, so um, so it's very important to understand that uh, this singularity is in a quantity which, in principle, we can measure. Okay, so okay, so 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 how do we go about uh, reconciling uh, these singularity, uh, point charge, all these things within the Maxwell theory? Okay, and again, the modern perspective that we know is that we define a short length scale say A, which is much smaller than the typical length scales that we can probe. And then we all ask questions about uh, 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 keeping in mind that uh, this, uh, we are going to uh, ask questions about length scales, which are bigger or uh, uh, equal to uh, this small length scale A. Okay, so this, Kind of since I'm introducing a small length scale, so uh, you know wavelength is proportional to uh, one over length scale. Okay, this is the dimension. Okay, so then uh, small length would mean uh, uh, sorry uh, the wave number. Okay, so uh, wave uh, so small uh, wavelength would mean large wave number, and this is the reason why this is called ultraviolet. Okay. So, 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 one, uh, so the way to make uh, Maxwell's theory um, uh, consistent is to say that, okay, I'm only going to treat uh, the, the Maxwell theory uh, above uh, this length scale, okay? And uh, uh, then uh, this does not certainly mean that the point charge has a radius A. It's just that it means that the theory breaks down at that length scale, okay? And then we use this theory with this in mind and calculate various quantities. Okay, and we can calculate various quantities uh, which does not depend upon A. Okay, say the energy of the uh, electric field. Okay, the total energy which does not depend upon A. And uh, in certain situations, we can just uh, uh, set A to zero and go ahead and uh, do the calculations uh, and have the results. Okay, but this is not the only kind of quantity. We, we just realize that there is this measurable electric field which depends upon A uh, at very small distances. And we have to be, uh, for, uh, for such quantities, we have to be more careful. And uh, uh, this is exactly the territory of what is called renormalization group theory in some context or the other. Okay, so, uh, but uh, either way, whether it is this quantity or this quantity, 
we, uh, we uh, with this ultraviolet regulation, we know how to deal with this uh, um, uh, singularity. Um, and uh, uh, in other words, the Maxwell theory uh, can consistently uh, uh, be defined a priori uh, with uh, using a UV regulator. Okay. So, so this is the more modern version of trying to understand uh, the uh, theories that uh, they might not be applicable to various lens scales and particularly they might not be applicable to the smallest lens scale uh, that we are used to and uh, uh, hence we may need an ultraviolet regulator and in fact almost all the field theories that we know are of this kind and it requires ultraviolet uh, uh, regulators to define them properly okay so that's basically uh, the upshot okay and the particular example we have studied is maxwell's equation but uh, the examples uh, this is not certainly not the only example as we shall see okay so okay so um, so sometimes it's easy to see uh, that uh, there, uh, what is the natural UV regulator, like if we are working on a lattice in a condensed matter problem, then the smallest lens scale is the uh, lattice uh, length, uh, the distance between two sides, uh, or if I take a lattice, like say a square lattice, so here is a point and here is a point and then there is a distance and uh, but in some other cases, it is there. Are, uh, it is uh, uh, less apparent, and one has to uh, think more carefully. As is the situation with uh, field theories of particle physics, and uh, but we understand uh, these ideas uh, fairly well now. Okay, good. So, so that's uh, the, uh, that's the uh, Maxwell theory uh, uh, with this uh, important idea that uh, there is a UV regulator that we might need and all field theories that we want to um, investigate or all theories we want to investigate must come up with uh, such UV regulators I and mean, think about Newton's law, think about any field theory or any theory that you know and you would find that all these theories uh, has a um, um, uh, has a UV regulator. Otherwise, uh, it is very difficult to uh, uh, make sense of everything within, uh, within the theory. Okay. So, so uh, okay, good. So, um, okay. So that uh, so with that, I have conveyed the first important uh, uh, issue that I wanted to specify: the idea of UV regulator. Okay. So at this point, question. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, Sandeep has a question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So, so my question is, I, mean, I don't know about it. Uh, so that's why I'm asking. Uh, uh, you said that uh, we are fair, encountering a sort of a divergence at r equal to zero for the Coulomb's law. Mm -hmm. Is that yes. same as saying that uh, when you get a equal to zero, is that situation the same with that one? Uh, when yeah. I sure. So, so you can think about uh, changing the Coulomb's law. So, uh, changing the uh, this say, uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah, changing the Coulomb's law such uh, to this modified version, which is Q by four pi r plus a square into r hat okay hmm. so you can see that uh, now if you put r equal to zero okay uh, for, for small uh, a uh, there, there is uh, uh, it approximately is the same thing but it becomes worse and worse as you make r closer to a okay so in fact if you put r equal to uh, a equal to zero, you get the same divergence uh, as uh, okay. So that's basically one way of saying this. The other way of saying that is that I'll only consider this form for r bigger or equal to a distance a. Okay. So that I don't encounter this. Uh, so, uh, so that would basically uh, mean that I have a three D space r cube. 
okay and i scoop out a small uh, sphere of radius a okay so the theory is valid for all these points but not within this sphere okay more questions uh, there are some questions in the chat box can you check okay so okay uh, i believe that tokish x question uh, i uh, uh, yeah, long time to answer but uh, that was a example i guess so the first question is by akash anand uh, the, how do we know that forces between two charges is, is finite at r equal to 0 what does it mean uh, by a force between uh, them at r equal to 0 uh, yeah so this is basically uh, the, the point that i am uh, trying to uh, uh, mean so th this maxwell uh, theory is not equipped to answer this question okay uh, uh, the concept of uh, so we do not know what it means to uh, the, so when we say force we mean newton's law okay and to uh, understand newton's law as i wrote down we have to uh, write down the uh, lorentz force equation and try to solve it etc cetera, etc cetera. but once we uh, the put r equal to zero we are no longer sure that all this lorentz force law that we write in this form uh, and things like that it is not um, it is at all uh, meaningful uh, to use those uh, concepts so um, uh, so so you are right in saying that we uh, should not try to ascribe a meaning to this and in fact that's what i was uh, uh, trying to uh, say that uh, yeah so uh, uh, does that uh, make sense uh, akash Okay, good. So, uh, so uh, Orpon Sinha has a question uh, that so the regul uh, the question is so the regulator means a length scale uh, lattice spacing beyond which we cannot investigate uh, with the current method whatever uh, we are using. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Okay, uh, without a regulator, uh, field theories are meaningless. Okay, without a huge regulator, uh, any theory is meaningless to the best of our understanding uh, of uh, our current uh, physical theories okay okay any more question good okay shall we go back then okay so okay so so having understood the concept of a uv regulator let's turn to another important concept and still keeping to maxwell's equation that is this charge conservation okay so you know that uh, from maxwell's equation we can derive the charge conservation and actually that i should have said uh, assignment zero derive this okay okay so, um, uh, and so the, the fact that electric charge, electric charge is conserved, okay? And this, as you know, is a, um, uh, is a general character of uh, theories that there are certain list of symmetries which are, uh, 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 which are conserved um, you know, for certain systems. And in fact, to specify the theory, we need to list all the symmetries and how the degrees of freedom transform under all these symmetries. Okay? So, uh, so that's, uh, it's, uh, without, uh, make, uh, without providing a list, um, uh, it is absolutely uh, impossible to understand the nature of a theory uh, or uh, to uh, understand what the equations mean uh, 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 without knowing the symmetries of the theory. Okay, so th uh, so uh, so one thing that we saw is that we need a UV regulator to define the theory. The next thing that we need is the list of symmetries. Okay, for example, like the charge conservation, and um, in case of uh, electromagnetic theory. Uh, I mean, I could go on and ex uh, with the examples, but uh, the, I'll just uh, list three. Uh, so these are the degrees of freedom. 
Okay, so for the moment, uh, I have also listed something called the magnetic charge and the magnetic current. Okay, just ignore them for the moment. They would become clear uh, as we go on. Mm, but uh, the rest you are familiar with. And uh, this is the charge conjugation symmetry. Okay, so it takes a positive charge and takes it to minus. Okay, this is the parity. Okay. This takes uh, inverse space, okay? And this is the time reversal, okay? So this keeps time invariant, and time reversal is basically the other partner which keeps space invariant but changes time. Okay. So if you ask wh uh, what are the symmetries of the degrees of freedom, the electric charge, the electric current, the uh, electric field, and the magnetic field, you would find that, the, uh, let's take example, um, electric charge, it is certainly odd under charge conjugation because that any charge positive uh, goes to negative under charge conjugation. Similarly, electric charge, as you would find, is even under space inversion. That is easy to see from the Gauss's law, equal to rho. So, uh, this goes to minus of this, okay, and you're uh, free to uh, choose uh, uh, within this. So you choose uh, this to go to minus of E, and then this should go to, okay. So that's this. Okay. Similarly, you can work out the rest of this table, and this is one implementation of the symmetries, of uh, these three symmetries, okay. So then, these, uh, uh, the, uh, this is what I mean by drawing a symmetry table. Without understanding uh, this uh, kind of symmetry table, we don't get enough insights into the nature of the theory. Okay, as we shall uh, see if we, uh, the, uh, when we reach uh, topological uh, insulators. Uh, okay, good. Okay, so so that's the second ingredient. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, any questions? Okay, good. So, uh, so if there, I think yeah. there are some questions in the chat box again. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So let me try to go back to this chat. I don't know why this is opening this. Okay. Okay. Maybe I, I can tell you the questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the okay, first I question. Can see oh, yeah. This. I can see this. Okay. So, um, okay, so that's uh, a comment. So, there is a question by Tista Banerjee. Uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the question is how do we know whether a particular theory is renormalizable or not? Okay, so that's a much more advanced question uh, than uh, uh, the level we are discussing on. Uh, it requires more work. Okay, we have to, uh, the, the, so, uh, so, so let's. So instead of trying to tell you the answer, which uh, uh, is um, uh, 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 which would uh, take us like more than five lectures uh, to answer uh, very carefully, uh, let me try to uh, explain the question uh, that is being pointed out. Uh, the question is that how do we know that introducing this artificial A, okay, uh, which looked like artificial in context of electromagnetism. I can express all the things, uh, the quantities, in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, exp uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the numbers, which does not depend upon a, which I have artificially introduced. Okay, yeah. So, so if I can explain, if I can express all the observables, all the measurable things in the theory in terms of numbers which does which uh, are also measurable quantities explicitly measurable quantities within the theory then i'll say that the theory is renormalizable okay so a priori it is not clear that given uh, this uh, theory and this artificial uv regulator uh, uh, i can uh, uh, the theory is renormalizable okay uh, one has to work more carefully to prove 
uh, uh, that the theory is renormalizable. And actually, as far as I understand, absolutely proving mathematically that, uh, uh, the, or uh, I mean, close to mathematical satisfaction, uh, that the theory is renormalizable is extremely hard. Okay, but uh, what we can do is that given the kind of uh, things, observables that we are used to, good two point correlation functions um, uh, in field theories and uh, things like that, once we calculate that and uh, we can order by order try to express them uh, the, in a, a perturbative series in terms of observable quantities within the theory, which does not depend upon A. Okay, so this is called the perturbative renormalized perturbation theory, and that's one way to perturbatively see whether a theory is renormalizable or not. Okay, so uh, I, uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, that's the way that uh, people usually start approaching this problem. Okay, and then uh, try to see some insight. Okay, I, I don't know this. Uh, this uh, uh, partially answers your, uh, uh, I mean, it certainly uh, doesn't answer your question, but uh, shows some insight to uh, what you uh, were trying to ask. Okay. Yeah, we, we have to work more. Uh, so, okay. So, uh, so then the, there is again a question by Akash Anand. Uh, the question is, uh, in this more fundamental theory, uh, uh, Okay, so uh, is I do not okay. There is a reason why magnetic monopoles do not exist, or does it explain that magnetic monopoles exist in the small lenses, but somehow uh, at the larger lens scales, they uh, their existence is, uh, somehow vanishes? Okay, so yeah, the, 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 uh, the one can go and ask all these uh, questions from the nature of the uh, fundamental theory. And someone actually suggests that magnetic monopoles exist, and this is what we are going to uh, discuss. Uh, actually, uh, the, why don't I answer your question uh, while I raise this uh, topic? That's as you might have uh, seen that the next topic is exactly magnetic monopoles, and I'll, uh, I have a, a sentence uh, trying to ask your question. So, in some sense, I have preempted this question. Okay, so uh, at this point, uh, is there any other question? Otherwise, I'll start uh, magnetic monopoles and start by answering Akash's uh, question. Yeah, no, go on. Okay, good. So, okay, uh, okay, good. So, so then the uh, next thing <laughs> is uh, uh, basically magnetic monopoles. Okay, so. So we want to modify the Maxwell's equation and incorporate magnetic monopoles, okay? Both magnetic uh, charges uh, uh, and magnetic currents, okay? And uh, this is what some of these uh, quote unquote fundamental theories which are uh, valid seems to suggest that there exist such excitations, um, but we are not going to uh, try and understand how these theories, uh, the, how these theories uh, lead to magnetic monopoles. Instead, what we want to try and understand is that if this is uh, uh, what is uh, uh, happening, then what are uh, the fallouts of uh, such magnetic charges and magnetic currents? Okay. In particular, uh, a magnetic monopole, which is a magnetic analog of a point electric charge uh, and does not have any dipole moment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so uh, yes, this uh, the, to answer Akash's question, uh, they arise in uh, the, some of these uh, 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 field theories, which uh, high energy field theories, and uh, 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 and it uh, it seems to suggest that they have a large mass, which uh, all these uh, things that Akash pointed out. But let's we are not going, that's not our aim. Okay. So, uh, so let's uh, just try to see if we extend the magnetic, uh, the, the Maxwell's equation uh, the, as this, uh, what is the fallout? And in particular, what happens if I have, uh, uh, if I consider the magnetostatic limit with a magnetic monopole uh, at origin, which is a magnetic charge, uh, point charge of strength M, okay? And then we can solve the, uh, solve this equation and get uh, rho m 
of R, okay, to get the uh, magnetic field just by solving Gauss's law, um, okay. And again, it has a singularity at origin, but now we know that this can be regulated. Magnetic field is again uh, uh, observable and um, uh, uh, it has a singularity and uh, we know how to regulate it using a UV regulator, okay? Okay, good. So now uh, the particular, so you see that I am constantly uh, introducing things, but uh, I'm not discussing them in any generality. Okay, that's, uh, I am trying to zoom in on particular problems so that I can show you where this ideas of topology arises. And for example, it's a perfectly valid problem to think about, to take this magnetic field of a monopole and try to think about the mo classic motion of a classical charge in this magnetic field. Okay, which is given by this. Okay, and uh, you are, uh, yeah, I mean, you should go and try to solve it uh, both classically and quantum mechanically. And say for classical, uh, this is an assignment which you can try to do um, and on your own and try to solve uh, this. And as long as you stay away from origin, uh, that would need the regulator. Uh, it is, uh, you can just go ahead and solve this problem. Maybe in, if you give too, uh, too bad initial conditions, then you will not be able to integrate uh, this uh, analytically, but uh, you know how to solve this problem. Okay, so that's uh, one way of going about it. Okay, but what we are going to be interested in is uh, the situation uh, and, uh, but let me just point out that uh, once we do this, and there is absolutely no problem in uh, the, taking this magnetic field and solving the motion of the electric charge uh, in this fashion. Okay? Okay. But we are not interested in that. We want to understand what happens when uh, the electric charge uh, needs, uh, is, uh, needs to be treated quantum mechanically. In other words, uh, uh, one has to invoke uh, quantum mechanics to understand the motion of the electric charge. Okay. On the other hand, we shall assume that the magnetic monopole can still be described classically in the sense that it's, it's just static, heavy static magnetic monopole. Okay. So, so then uh, the, we can think about putting this magnetic monopole at origin and forget about it and, uh, 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 the, uh, and find out the motion of the electric charge in such uh, a magnetic field. Okay. So now we have to solve the Schrodinger equation of a particle in a magnetic field, uh, the magnetic field arising from a monopole. Okay. And the Hamiltonian for doing this is this. Okay. So, so, so that A is the vector potential coming from the monopole. Okay. So, so this is uh, the start uh, of uh, various set of problems that we are going to be uh, faced with. Okay. Uh, so, so just let me uh, take a pause. Uh, is there anyone who is not familiar with this Hamiltonian, this equation 11? Okay, so, uh, so if there is anyone who, who is uh, unfamiliar with this equation 11, uh, just let me know. Okay, otherwise I'll uh, go ahead. Uh, in chat or uh, just raise your voice, uh, whatever. Okay, so then I take that uh, you're familiar with this. Okay, good. So, um, uh, so then uh, uh, let's come to the problem, okay? So note that the, uh, the, uh, we arrived at the vector potential by using this condition and, uh, um, uh, and the magnetic field is actually a curl of the vector potential. And uh, in other words, since the magnetic field is uh, uh, solenoidal, uh, because it's uh, the usual magnetic field without the monopole is solenoidal. Um, that is, its divergence is zero. We can write it as a curl of another field. Okay, we have learned all these things as undergrad or high school or whatever. Okay, so but note that this is a uh, this is an example of what is called a local relation, and uh, what it means is that we need to know the value of this vector potential in the vicinity of uh, the point R 
to calculate the magnetic field at that r for example the z component of the magnetic field is given by uh, i mean is given by uh, this expression which requires to us to know uh, the vector potential in the vicinity of that point okay so yeah i could make this more mathematical but uh, it's basically uh, knowing the uh, uh, knowing the uh, uh, vector potential at a epsilon neighborhood okay of r okay so that's what we need so that's an example of a local relation okay so but uh, since uh, a is uh, not an observable okay uh, we do not need a uh, 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 to be globally defined i mean we know that a is not an observable it's not globally defined but uh, we only need it to be locally defined uh, to be able to define v of r uniquely at that point okay whatever a is doing we don't care much because it's not an observable okay or it's not a measurable uh, uh, but we should be absolutely make sure that b defined from a is unique okay and for that we only know the local uh, value of e okay so therefore we uh, conclude that uh, a uh, may not be uh, defined globally but it uh, may only be defined locally so that b is uh, 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 b is uh, uniquely defined okay and uh, then we see that that's exactly the case when this is no longer true that we can still go ahead and define a vector potential locally okay sorry this is okay we can define a vector potential locally even for a magnetic monopole where this condition is uh, valid but the price we have to pay is that the low vector potential is no longer given by the same function all over space okay so for example for the monopole you can take a vector potential which is given by this expression okay which is valid everywhere but because of this cot theta by 2 it is not valid at the uh, half plane a uh, half line which starts from uh, the origin and goes along the north pole okay so this is not valid on this line it is valid everywhere else similarly this expression is valid everywhere but except for this line uh, half line okay so in the common region where both a and b is uh, valid they are uh, they differ by a gauge choice a pure gauge as you can check okay so you can check this okay that uh, this a1 minus a2 uh, 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 equal to for theta not equal to 0 or pi is some gradient of some function so that's what i mean by it okay. So there are of course other choices, but the thing is that all of them have uh, two kinds of singularities. One is the r equal to zero singularity, which we already know is a remnant of the singularity of the point charge, and which we know how to regulate. And the consequence of that um, uh, is that I mean the reason for that is a, a magnetic monopole is at the origin and uh, uh, it can be regulated just like the coulomb uh, electric field okay but in addition there is this line singularity which is either alone uh, zero uh, theta equal to zero or theta equal to pi and uh, there we have this um, uh, uh, the uh, singularity in vector potential a but not in uh, the magnetic field and so the singularity is not in a physical observer okay and what we uh, need to understand is what are its consequences and these consequences are more subtle okay and this was first pointed out by Dirac, and uh, we will uh, go through uh, it maybe tomorrow uh, given the uh, time that i'm teaching okay uh, but uh, before we go on to understand 
these consequences of Dirac, which uh, would be quantization of the electric charge, okay, uh, we need to note the following, which would be very important for us. And these are, uh, the, the, these are the particular features of this example, which would be generalizable, okay? So, 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 so there is this unobservable singularity, line singularity in A, which ends on the monopole, which is the regularized singularity in the observable B. Okay, so, so, so you see that the, the crucial thing is that these two singularities cannot be detached from each other. Okay, whatever gauge I have shown you two, form, uh, two forms of this A, whatever gauge I choose, okay, these singularities cannot be detached from each other. Okay, as long as I have that monopole, I'll have this line singularity. Okay. So, so the next point is that, again, we are within this extended Maxwell's equation, you can show that the magnetic charge is also conserved. Uh, the rho m, the integral of rho m is also conserved, and it has its own continuity equation. So it is, in some sense, a good quantum number of the system. By good quantum number, I mean, uh, this is a short colloquial way of saying that it's a conserved quantity. Okay? Uh, but however, they are, unlike the electric charge, okay, uh, the, uh, which is also a conserved quantity, a good quantum number, uh, uh, the, the, this comes with an attached string, okay? So just to, uh, uh, in, uh, just to um, um, sort of uh, continue with this one, uh, uh, there are uh, two kinds of quantum numbers, okay? So those which uh, comes without any string, okay? And those which comes with strings attached. Okay, and we will ex uh, find examples of both these kinds, and uh, uh, those which uh, comes without string are in some sense local quantum numbers, in some sense somewhat local. Okay, so we would understand the meaning of these terms as we go on, but uh, uh, so if they don't have any string attached to them, like this magnetic monopole, okay, the string may be uh, unobservable, but uh, the, there is a string attached, uh, okay, and we'll see its consequences. Um, and we would see that those are the kind of quantum numbers which we are more used to, okay? The spin quantum number, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the translation, all these, uh, the electric charge, all these are examples of this, okay? Whereas the ones that comes with their strings attached, okay, like the magnetic monopole, uh, uh, we would call them topological quantum numbers, and we will see uh, an example. Uh, we will see why this is so. Okay. So, so one feature we will see is that because of this feature that the string uh, has to be present, uh, the position of the string, uh, as we uh, found out, can be this half line uh, theta equal to zero or theta equal to pi, but uh, the, it absolutely needs to be present. It can be anywhere else, but uh, okay. So, so this kind of property says that uh, the details of the position of the string really does not matter uh, for the magnetic monopole, uh, okay. Uh, so these kind of, uh, because of this, uh, 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 because of this um, uh, uh, independence from the details of uh, the position of the string, the topological quantum numbers, as we'll see, uh, sometimes have extra robustness, okay? And we will need to explain what uh, the, we mean by these words, okay? Um, that make them immune to these details, okay? This is the characteristic features. And we will, of course, need to modify uh, the above observations and generalize them as we go on. But uh, uh, if we understand, so th the point is that if we understand these two classes of quantum numbers, uh, symmetry related quantum numbers and topological quantum numbers, that's a good starting point of being able to understand um, uh, what uh, the topology uh, actually, uh, what topological ideas uh, uh, can uh, uh, do or uh, the, when they are relevant to a uh, physical system. Okay, so, okay. So uh, I'll take one more pause and uh, ask for questions. 
Uh, so, so, bro, I had a question. I mean, so yes. if in this uh, Maxwell's equations with the magnetic charge, I mean the magnetic uh, charge and the electric charge, they, I mean, the, everything looks very completely symmetrical. So, why is there a difference between? Yeah. So, uh, this is uh, because. Uh, so, you can ask uh, uh, why is uh, uh, there? Uh, 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 so, everything looks so. Okay, let me just go back to this equation. Okay, so yeah, everything looks symmetrical in uh, E and B and rho and M. Okay, except for these minus signs. Um, okay, uh, why uh, is it? It turns out that uh, it is uh, because uh, in uh, it's a question of basis. Okay. So in one basis, the, one, the basis that I'm using, the electric field and the electric charges appear as local uh, quantities. There is actually another basis in which the magnetic charge is local, but the electric charge is non-local. Okay. So this is called the, this is called the electromagnetic duality. Okay. And the main statement, so there, if I were using the basis, okay, just not to confuse, uh, the, I didn't uh, introduce that. Um, uh, if I were using that basis, in that basis, the magnetic charge would be a local quantity and the electric charge would be a, a topological uh, quantity, okay? It turns out that because of the structure of the Maxwell's equation, we cannot have a basis in which uh, both of these are local quantities, okay? That's because of the vector potential uh, that we need to introduce to quantize the Okay? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, sir, uh, yeah. Uh, so I have three questions actually. In this uh, set of equations, it's updated and modified, you know, Maxwell's equation. The, the, I mean, can you go back to that slide now? Huh? Yeah. Uh, this uh, curl E, I mean, this JM comes with a minus sign. Is there any physical significance yeah. of this minus sign of the J? Uh, I think it's the same physical significance of this minus sign, the, uh, which uh, is basically the Faraday's law, the physics of Faraday's law. I mean, the, uh, in Faraday's law, what happens is, I mean, uh, the flux changes in such a way that it tries to minimize the production of the electron. Yes. yes. Uh, so you are saying that. This here the JM, but here the JM, I mean, there is no time variation of the JM, so there is no point of no production. Of yeah, but uh, J itself is a time varying quantity. J, JM is roughly uh, uh, del QM by del T. Right? Okay. And, uh, okay. Uh, so I have one more question. I mean, uh, you were yes. talking about a string, but is that taking a line of singularity, right? Yeah. Yeah, of, so of course. In complex so, analysis, uh, we, uh, I mean, uh, read something like the branch cut. I mean, hmm. if there's any similarity of that concept which ends, I mean, uh, for a finite branch cut, the moment the function hits. So, so this is not an analytic plane, right? Uh, the, yes, uh, it is related. So, in if I were looking at a uh, 2D complex plane of analytic functions, it has an analog there, okay, which is a branch cut. But remember, this is a 3D sphere, right? So, so this is our, we are thinking about uh, three-dimensional space. Okay, Z, X, Y, okay. And then uh, the, uh, the singularity is along the North Pole, okay? Yes. So generally, we won't be able to use the, uh, uh, use the machinery of analytic functions. I mean, uh, the, uh, of course, uh, yeah, I can define all these things in two dimensions, and there I can use these powerful theorems of analytic uh, functions. And uh, you uh, are, I mean, I think yeah, since you raised this question, yeah, you should uh, uh, try and derive all the Maxwell's equation, etc., uh, for two dimension, two plus one dimension, one being time and see what the structure of Maxwell's equation is. You would find that the magnetic field is no longer a vector, it's just a scalar, it's a pseudo scalar, and so on and so forth. So those kind of electromagnetism are also known in physics. Those are called two, two plus one D electromagnetism. Okay. 
those are severely constrained by uh, the anticlinal structure of the 2D plane. Uh, and sir, uh, that Hamiltonian, I mean, that time you were asking uh, us that whether we have any doubt or not, when I raised my hand, but I uh, sort of got under okay. so that okay. Hamiltonian, yeah. why that uh, yes. imaginary I is coming, I mean, it should, shouldn't be that, e minus q wave. Oh, sorry, sorry, that's, uh, that's uh, important. Yeah, that's a typo. That's a okay. typo. Okay, thank yeah. you, sir. Sorry, thanks, thanks. Uh, yeah. Okay, more questions. Okay, are there questions in the chat? Okay, so there is a. There is a question by Shayoni Chatterjee. Uh, the question is I do not understand why are you saying quantum numbers without strings to be local? The magnetic monopoles, which are assumed to be at origin, uh, and gives rise to a vector potential having the string singularity. Isn't that a local quantum number? Uh, can it, uh, yeah, so uh, the, uh, the, the answer is that no, it is not a local quantum number because it has this string which runs from the origin. So, uh, uh, so let me just go to the book. So it has this uh, string. So this is a position at r equal to zero. And suppose I take this form of a, which is uh, some m by four by r into cot theta by two, okay, into phi hat, okay, phi hat, okay. So this has a string uh, of singularity, okay. All the, uh, all for all r for all r okay if i put theta equal to uh, uh, zero okay i have singularity running all the way to infinity okay r equal to infinity so because of this line singularity running from all uh, um, uh, uh, zero to infinity i mean i could choose this direction or i could choose uh, or i could choose uh, the this direction okay this direction or this direction or any of these directions you are welcome to write down. Okay. I need to have one string. Okay. And this is the reason, uh, this is basically what we will see uh, is a feature of uh, um, uh, topological quantum numbers. And the fact that there, uh, even though the charge is at origin, it has an associated non-local string which runs from uh, the charge to uh, all the way to infinity uh, or uh, I mean think about another monopole so suppose I have another monopole here okay this is a m this is an a minus m then the string could end here okay so then uh, both of these uh, conditions so because uh, the, of this non-localness uh, introduced by the string I am calling it uh, uh, topological quantum number, uh, and we will see that this is a feature of the uh, topological quantum numbers. So, yeah, does that answer your question? Oh, no, no, no. The local tag is not because of the monopole is static. I can give some kinetic energy to the monopole um, and uh, it still remains a non-local uh, thing. Okay, okay. So there is a. Uh, okay, uh, there is a question by uh, the uh, Prashant, and uh, we, uh, what is the experimental manifestation of the Dirac string? Okay, uh, we'll see. Uh, the short answer is quantization of electric charge. Okay, so we'll. Uh, that's the whole point we are discussing. Uh, this we would discuss those points. Okay. So, okay, so there, there is uh, another uh, question by uh, Singer Velen, uh, TR, and um, the question is, uh, what do you mean by the term string? Okay, uh, so this confuses me. Okay, so I mean, uh, what I mean by uh, the string is basically this. So, suppose uh, I write A as uh, as I wrote down m by minus sign 4 pi r into cot theta by 2 uh, phi hat. 
Okay, so there is this r equal to zero singularity, and then suppose I think about a sphere of radius r naught. Okay, so I want to calculate the vector potential on this sphere. So I am away from this singularity. So this is a sphere of radius r naught. Okay, so what is the value of the uh, vector potential on this? Okay. So I can calculate it from say at on the equator, okay, where theta is equal to pi by two, okay. So then I get a is equal to minus m by four pi r naught into uh, 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 okay. So what is uh, pi by two? Uh, pi by four is like square root two, okay. One, something like that. Okay, but similarly, I can measure this at pi. Okay, and it would be something. But if I put the, uh, the value to be at theta equal to zero, okay, at each of these points. So let's take this point. It is infinite. Okay, and if I had taken a radius. Uh, th this radius it is infinite. It, this radius it's infinite all the way, all for all radiuses. In addition, even if I leave out this r equal to c, okay. So so this is a line singularity. So line singularity, okay. And this is the short. Uh, I'm calling the line singularity in short as a string, okay. And more precisely, I call it a Dirac stream. Yeah. So does that answer your question? Okay, good. Uh, okay, uh, so more questions. Okay, good. So let's uh, move on. And we have like uh, mm, uh, uh, 12 minutes, now 11 minutes by my watch. Uh, so uh, what I, uh, since uh, the direction that I want to go is to solve, uh, to understand this motion of a quantum electric charge in a, uh, in a static uh, monopole. And uh, then uh, what I uh, want to, uh, so to this, uh, uh, direction, I we would tr uh, try to recap the path integral formulation of quantum mechanics. Okay, so uh, uh, so uh, so that's what I want to do. So is it okay, uh, Abhishek? If I uh, go go on till twelve thirty-five or forty? Yeah, that should be okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'll take uh, basically what I'll do is that I'll go through the path integral formulation of quantum mechanics. I mean, basically uh, things that you know. Um, again, uh, the, the, but uh, the, I'll recap it in a way uh, that we uh, focus on uh, things that we need. Okay. And uh, but the aim uh, is to try and understand this problem. Okay. This happens to be a, a very important problem. Okay. Okay, and what we will do is that what we want to know is when this is given by a monopole vector potential. But of course, once we, uh, we do, really don't want to solve it for only uh, that situation, we want to solve it for a, a particle in a magnetic field, uh, okay, so given by any vector potential. So once there is a magnetic field, there is a vector potential, and without specifying the nature, uh, the, uh, the a particular form of this, we want to know the answer. Okay. In fact, uh, for the particular monopole, that uh, it is a very important assignment to solve this uh, for the monopole um, that we discussed, where A is given, and uh, that's one of the. Uh, uh, I mean, that's actually uh, the uh, uh, one of the most important problems that was solved uh, um, in this uh, area. Uh, I mean, its importance compares to uh, the solution of, uh, say, uh, hydrogen atom uh, uh, problem. Okay, and indeed, the solution is very similar to the, that of hydrogen atom problem. But I encourage you to solve this. Uh, uh, the the uh, solve the Schrodinger equation 
for a single charge in a monopole uh, vector potential. Okay, so uh, I mean, please uh, try to do that, mm, and that's very instructive. Okay, so. Mm, so let's try to understand uh, the uh, path integral formalism and I'll uh, switch over to uh, my handwritten notes, which I think is useful, but uh, okay. So, uh, so I'll uh, try to go, it, uh, go, go over it at a moderate pace. Uh, just stop me if you have any question. Okay. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so the usual form of quantum mechanics that we learned is what is called the Hamiltonian formalism. And just like classical mechanics, uh, the, uh, it also has a Lagrangian formalism, which, and, uh, which uh, uh, is known as the path integral formulation of quantum mechanics. And what we are going to recap is the uh, path integral formulation of a single particle quantum mechanics, which you can take any book, uh, for example, the book by Anthony Z um, or anything. Uh, the, the, uh, to try and recap this, okay? So the problem that we want to understand is that suppose a particle starts from uh, initial uh, position xi and it wants to go to uh, final position xf at time, uh, in time t, what is the amplitude of this? And that's given by this, okay? So, okay, so anyone who is not familiar with this expression, Okay, uh, you should uh, stop me now. Okay, so I'll, okay. So, uh, yeah, either write in or uh, stop me because that's uh, the starting point. Okay, good. I, then I assume that everyone is okay with this expression, both the notation and the content. Okay. So now, Suppose between X, uh, Xi and Xf, there is a, uh, there, there is a um, uh, double screen like this, okay? So the particle can go this or this. So then we know that uh, it is going to be a sum of amplitudes. Uh, it uh, starts from, um, it starts from Xi, then uh, the amplitude for this process is uh, i to x1, then x1 to xf, okay? And this is the time t1 is taken uh, for it to reach here. And similarly, uh, there is uh, i to x2, and then x2 to xf, okay? And then uh, we see that uh, we can write this as a sum of the two possibilities x of p, where p ranges from one to two in this case, because I have two uh, sli uh, slits, uh, and it basically the time accordingly is t of p, okay? Okay, good. So then we can just uh, make this, um, uh, 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 the transformation, and we see that this is an identity because either it has to go, uh, uh, through uh, slit A or slit 2. So then this is an identity and that is then equal to the, our expression xf e to the power minus i h t by h cross xi. Okay. So therefore, we now instead of two slits, suppose we have n slits. Okay. So then this is the expression. Okay. The only difference with what we had here is that the sum is no longer one to two, but sum runs from one to n. Okay, so that's so that's one. Now suppose I add more and more screens. Okay, so I add more and more screens here, here, screen one, screen two, screen three, screen four. Okay, so for each of them. I can uh, do this, okay? So then you see that this is screen one, which has uh, N1 slits. This is screen two, which has N2 slits. And then this is screen N, which has uh, N, uh, N, N uh, slits. And for each of them, okay, I have uh, this. So the idea is that for these paths, so this is one path, this is second path, okay? 
So I am uh, breaking it over all this and uh, adding them over. And that's okay. So, so where the total time is, of course, the time that I want. So now we can think about free space as the number, both the number of slits and the, the number of such diffraction screens and the number of uh, slits, both going to infinity. Okay, so that's one way of uh, trying to understand that. And then you would see that you can write this. So then the summation becomes integral. Okay, so, so each summation was over these screens. So that's screen one, okay? So this becomes an integral over this entire region. And then there is screen two. So, so that's an integral. This integral, then uh, so screen zero, I start from counting. So then there is an integral over this, that's screen one, and so on and so forth, okay? And then I have these divisions. So each of them is the small section going from one screen to another okay and the screens are infin infinitely dense now okay. and then let's take uh, the uh, this uh, this time taken from one screen to another uh, as delta t and clearly delta t if i have small n screens delta t is the total time divided by the number of screens and in the number of screens going to infinity limit delta t goes to zero Okay, so that's my small parameter. So now what we uh, can write is that this was, uh, this is the sum where I have sort of infinite number of integrals. Okay, so that's the path integral. Okay, so I have an infinite set of integrals. Okay, that's, so um, uh, of course, uh, once you want to think about this uh, more carefully, you should take this limit and the, the integral, uh, it does not make any sense to say there are infinite number of integrals. The, uh, actually, uh, the right way to think about this is that there are finite number of integrals and that number is gradually increasing and we should take this limiting process. And this is a, this is a shorthand notation for this object, okay? This is, uh, so whenever I write this, I actually mean this, okay? Instead of writing this cumbersome thing, I'll just use a shorthand, okay? And then I have this whole set, xn to xn minus one, n minus one to n minus two, all the way up to xn to zero. And then of course this n pieces, okay? Such that for each such small slice, okay? I have this piece, okay? And I want to understand what this piece looks like, okay? So this, that's between two time slices or two screens, okay? So one at tau, one at tau minus one, one at tau. So that's. So then the, for uh, small time uh, slice and a free particle, the, uh, this is the Hamiltonian for a free particle. And I um, want to uh, understand this, okay? So the free particle Hamiltonian is not diagonal, it's in real space, but in momentum space. So I need to introduce the momentum, full set of momentum eigenvalues. I'm basically using basic quantum mechanics, so I'm not elaborate, I'm uh, elaborate much, but you see that I have introduced this identity, which is T P tau, P tau, P tau. These are complete set of momentum eigenvalues. So that's, so then I can, uh, this Hamiltonian is now diagonal and this is the form, okay? And this overlap, using this being the overlap, okay? I can write this single slice in this form, okay? So this piece is this piece, okay? And this of course is this piece. And then I can integrate out the momentum, okay? And there are controlled ways of doing that uh, through analytic continuation, uh, but I can do that, 
okay you can uh, go over these notes and okay what i end up doing is this okay such that for if i arrange all these slides and put back in the expression i get this expression where this is an integral measure okay which is basically same uh, as, uh, as this okay and then i have this quantity coming from the endpoints okay and then for each slice i have this i delta t by h bar into m x dot tau tau being the slice number squared by 2 okay and that's this point and the sum is over all slices now So now we know that we are interested in this delta tau equal to zero limit, and we can see that we can write it in this form, okay, where I can write this as e to the power, this whole thing now, this whole thing now as e to the power i s by h bar, where s is the continuum limit of this thing, which is dt into mx dot. So note that this is nothing but the kinetic energy okay. and this is called the action okay and uh, whatever the integrant is called the lagrangian of the system so this is the lagrangian of a free particle um, okay the quantum mechanical uh, the classical lagrangian okay which we are familiar with okay. again you can start with uh, h and uh, uh, with the potential okay particle in a potential and show that the lagrangian is given by now the kinetic energy minus v of x okay where these are no longer operators okay these are uh, uh, fields okay so that's an assignment that you can show and some of the tricks that uh, you would need i'll just discuss uh, now okay but we are interested in this object this is the our hamiltonian uh, this we might be interested but uh, right now we are interested in this okay so how to think about this so notice that the problem is that uh, p and a of x both cannot be brought into the same diagonal form because of the uncertainty relations. Okay. And that's why we have to be careful. Okay. So we expand the Hamiltonian. Okay. Like this. Okay. Expand. And I have to be careful about the ordering of P and A because they don't commute. And in fact, their commutation is given by this. Okay. So, so this is. Uh, f of x into p okay is equal to i h cross del f del x okay something like this so this is a more fancy version of that so then i can write down i can take this term okay and write it down as this and uh, using this i get this there is this extra piece okay that i have so this is my hamiltonian it involves uh, momentum and this product of momentum and uh, position variables okay. so i have to be careful about this object because this is something that contains both momentum and position which are uh, kind of brought diagonal uh, diagonalized into the same form other than that this and this is diagonalized in uh, real space, and this is diagonalized in moment of space. This we know already know how to diagonalize. Okay. So again, for small uh, time slice, we look at small time slice, a uh, single time like this, and this is diagonalized. This part is diagonalized in real space, so that becomes this. Okay. Now, if it hit, if you hit it with a ket from the right okay for this term since this is uh, this is on the left uh, the, this operator becomes this uh, the c number 
Okay, so this is a C number, which is why it's written red. This is still an operator. Okay, because I cannot hit it with this because it's not diagonal. Okay, I can hit it, but I will get a differential operator. So then I do the same thing. I introduce uh, the here uh, the identity resolution D P P. Okay, that's what has been done here. Okay, and now this becomes this operator. Uh, okay. So if I arrange everything, it becomes this. Okay, and now I am in business. I can complete the squares. Okay, as before, I can complete the squares, and you can go through this calculation. Uh, you would see that you get this quantity. Okay, this quantity you already got. Okay, this are constants which does not contain, uh, which only contains a of x, which are not important for our purpose. But okay, and this is the extra piece which couples with x dot. Okay, note that these are at two different time slices. Okay, in the in the process that we have discretized, uh, but uh, in the continuum limit, uh, it gives rise to this. Okay, up to a gradient term, which is which I am neglecting because it's delta t square. Okay, so then from the earlier discussion, what we have is an action which is given by two pieces. The first piece, which is the free particle, and then there is this piece, okay, which is charge into x dot into a into dt. But you see that I can convert the integral over dt with a integral over dx because x dot into dt is dx. Okay. So the uh, the phase is this, okay. So so this was nothing but the free particle contribution, and we have an extra contribution here. Okay. So uh, so what we are going to understand uh, tomorrow is starting with the implication of this. Okay. Uh, first, in context of what is called a Berry phase and a Hanna Bohm phase, so the, the, this uh, I would show is uh, uh, the, so so just to make sure. Uh, so this part depends upon the actual path that you take from Xi to Xa. Okay, this on the other hand only depends upon the endpoints. Okay, so that. Their implications and their uh, consequences are very different. And uh, what we are going to concentrate on is this, okay? And the generalized version of this phase is called the Berry phase, okay? And uh, we would see that the, uh, the, we would then refer to as this as the Berry action. Okay? And we would try to understand the next time we meet tomorrow, uh, we would try to understand the implications of this phase action, okay, in context of Arnold Bohm phase and the quantization of the electric charge. Okay, good. So I think that's a good place to stop. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the far behind uh, what I wanted to cover, but that's absolutely fine. Um, uh, I just uh, need to make, uh, I mean, it's more important that we uh, discuss and understand various things. So, okay, so I'll stop. And if there are any more questions, we can uh, uh, go over them. So, questions. I already have uh, one question from Tista Banerjee. Uh, let's uh, try to uh, start with that. Uh, so the question is, uh, you have said that if there is a monopole and an anti-monopole, then the Dirac string will start from M and end in minus M. If there was a similar Dirac, uh, similar string structure possible in case of bound vortex anti-vortex pairs in a 2D XY model, 
Yes. Uh, again, this is um, this is exactly uh, why we are discussing all this. Okay. This is uh, the uh, the two D X Y model, etc. Is something that we would discuss, and instead of going, uh, so that would involve a lot of approximate calculation uh, and things like that. Uh, the, we are just preparing. Uh, the, towards uh, doing those calculations by introducing what are the central things we need to keep track. So, it's 2D XY model is a very complicated model. I mean, uh, if you don't, if you haven't come across, those of you who haven't come across, uh, you will do this. But um, uh, the, for those of you who have seen this, it's a very complicated model. Okay, both the classical and quantum mechanical, it has uh, lots of rich physics uh, that. Uh, uh, but some of the structures that we are learning here, the aim is that we can sort of throw away all the complications and look through the complications uh, and uh, find out what we actually need. Uh, okay, and here we are developing our technical uh, the insight uh, towards that. You are absolutely correct that there are going to be such strings which start and end in vortices. Okay, yeah. So there is another question by Shom Shubhra Ghosh. Um, yeah, the question is, is it correct to generalize the topological quantum numbers that are associated with line singularities? And if yes, uh, is there a general prescription of probing it? Because you said that they are unobservable or uh, unmeasurable. So, uh, so, so uh, uh, yes, so the question is that, uh, uh, in this case, they are unobservable, and in many cases, they are unobservable. Okay, and we would uh, the, uh, the see uh, that, but every time they would have definite consequences. Okay, uh, in the particular case, as I, uh, I think Prashant asked this, um, uh, the consequence is that the quantization of the electric charge. And in all the cases, the, the x y vortices uh, the, that we will see, um, uh, we will uh, uh, the, we will uh, try to understand their consequences. Every time, even if they are uh, unobservable, they have definite consequences. This is why uh, we need to distinguish uh, between topological and uh, symmetry related quantum numbers. Because if the Dirac string, even if they are ob unobservable, did not have any consequences, then there is no way we could distinguish between the topological and the symmetric quantum numbers. Because even with uh, being unobservable, they have consequences, uh, we have to distinguish between them to make sure that we have our ideas correct. So, okay, so there is uh, another question from Tista. Is there a free string in case of free vortices? Uh, I don't know what you mean by free string, but the strings have always have, uh, just like the monopole comes, uh, you cannot separate the monopole from the, uh, from the Dirac string. You cannot separate the vortex from the string as we will shall see, okay? So, uh, so in the uh, worst case, uh, the, the string can go to the infinity because suppose you have one vortex, uh, the string can go to infinity. Okay. Now, of course, your system does not extend. Uh, so the electromagnetism extends all over the universe, but the XY model is just some piece of magnet or some superfluid. It does not extend all over the universe. Uh, so, so, it, uh, so by infinity, we would mean uh, the edge of the system uh, in the thermodynamic limit. And that's the another limit. So we have seen the UV regulator. We are yet to see uh, IR regulator. And uh, uh, that's something that we would need to learn. Yeah, so it extends uh, to uh, the edge of the uh, system. And to define it more consistently, we would need to define another concept, which is called the IR regulator, or the continuum and thermodynamics limit. Yeah, we will come to that. Yeah, so this is an extremely important question. It's very important to have this kind of discussions because you see that um, uh, as physicists, uh, unless we understand uh, what are the implications of this mathematics, it's not, uh, of no use to us. Okay, so we should be able to draw imperfect, approximate cartoon pictures. Uh, 
to make sure that we understand the implications of the mathematics. Okay, at least I find that very useful. Uh, unless we understand things approximately, uh, uh, the, the, we uh, cannot, uh, in terms of drawing uh, uh, approximate pictures, cartoon pictures of doing things, uh, the cartoon pictures uh, may not be the cartoon uh, uh, that we see in newspapers and uh, mm, yeah, things like that, but physicist cartoons, uh, it's extremely important to have that level of insight and that's what we are trying to develop. So these questions are very important. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the question uh, from Prashant is that can we get topology in classical systems other than electromagnetic fields? Yes, absolutely. We will, uh, the, the XY model is an example. The vortices are an example, classical XY model. It's just that uh, the, the, uh, the, those are uh, slightly more tricky. Uh, that's why uh, we need to uh, first make sure that we understand this, uh, general uh, ideas uh, in context of electromagnetism. Yeah. We'll uh, come to those XY models. Yeah, there is a uh, raise of hand by Tista uh, question. Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I want to ask that uh, if we, uh, we consider the periodic boundary condition, yeah, yeah. Then, uh, if there are two vortex at the uh, big, uh, vortex anti vortex, yes, will, it, will there be a direct stream from uh, one to another through this period boundary condition? Yeah, the, the, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, this is uh, exactly the reason why uh, we have uh, the, uh, the pairs of cyclones on the surface of the earth. Okay, so you can think about uh, uh, cyclones and anticyclones, which are like vortices and anti vortices, and um, they are connected by uh, in, uh, invisible string. But the fact that there is a string, uh, there needs to be a string which ends in a vortex, makes sure that once you have a periodic boundary condition, you cannot have one vortex or one anti vortex. That's for example, a measurable, there was a question by someone, I forget, sorry. Um, yeah, Shom uh, Shubdo. That's, for example, a, a measurable consequence of uh, the string that uh, you need to have at least two. Yeah, uh, does that answer your question, Tista? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Shondi. Uh, sir, can you yeah. go back to the last slide? Um, that uh, E to the power last I slide. This one? Yes. Uh, so my first question is that integral, the second integral, e to the power i q by q. Huh, yes, this one. The, this hmm. integral, a x t x, this is, this is not a closed integral, right? It's not a closed No, integral. this is not a closed integral. Yeah. Okay. Sir, uh, is, there, is, it, is there any possibility that for some values of the x, this a x blows up? In that, uh, huh? Say that again? My question is that, is there any possibility that for some values of the x, I mean for the path on which I'm taking up the integration, the ax itself blows up? Yeah. So it can happen. For example, uh, if, I, if I take a path which is, um, uh, the, uh, which crosses this uh, north pole, so suppose I take uh, the, this, uh, so let's see if I can write this. So if I take a, uh, let's go to this. So if I, uh, oh, the, here is the point. So if I take a path which crosses this, okay, say so this is I, this is F, okay, and it crosses this line, okay, then of course the integral blows up, okay. The point is that in spite of that, we would see that the physics does not depend on that because we can perform local surgeries, like I can def uh, uh, change the path slightly around the singularity and since the the integrals uh, the, the only get uh, values uh, from the endpoints we can cure uh, this apparent what looks like an apparent singularity the way we generally deal the complex integrals the when we get a singularity the when we uh, uh, sort of something like that something of, like that yeah okay. something like that okay the uh, the more important thing is that it is a function of the endpoints Okay, that is why we can get away by doing this uh, local cure of singularities. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. So I uh, urge uh, those of you who have asked your questions to lower your hands, otherwise I cannot see. Uh, okay. So more questions. 
Uh, Shubhra, one qu qu quick question. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, so in general, like if I have a classical <laughs> Hamiltonian, let's say for a particle in electromagnetic yeah. field, of course, I can just yeah. uh, write the uh, corresponding classical, cl I'm just purely classical, I can write the Lagrangian, and typically yeah. that will appear in the action, right? In the, when you do the quantum thing, which is what you Say that again. So, I'm saying uh, just classically, if I consider the Lagrangian, yeah. Then this is what is, uh, I mean, quite, I mean, usually this is what will finally appear in the quantum. Yeah, quantum absolutely. Quantum, right, so, absolutely. Uh, but are there examples where this won't work and I have to do this, uh, uh, this uh, like limiting procedure? Uh, Sorry, I do, uh, did not get your question. Uh, no, so I'm saying, uh, see, one way I could do is I just, uh, like, uh, uh, start with the Hamiltonian and when I construct the path integral, I uh, put in this uh, path, uh, 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 the, I break up the path into this uh, many points and then yes. uh, uh, compute the limiting action, right? Yeah, yeah. But I could have just uh, used the fact, the finally I know that what I get is the, is just LDP where L is the classical action. Yeah, yeah. And does this always work or I, I have to be... No, it does not work. Uh, so, in fact, uh, these, uh, uh, the, uh, so, uh, the very phase, there are generalizations of the, the very phase terms, which are called topological terms, okay, which we would miss if I just use the classical Lagrangian. Okay. So, in the example, yeah, so this is... It, it works, right? Yeah, well, for this, so th this is why I want to use this example oh, okay. that okay, it okay. Uh, matches with whatever uh, we have uh, the calculated. Okay, right. so the, but the fact that we need to do this uh, the path integral formulation from scratch, okay, is the right way. Otherwise, we uh, stand a risk of missing terms. Okay. okay, particularly quantum interference terms, and we will discuss examples of those. Right. Okay, uh, just to make sure, I mean, this is an advanced comment. This is the term that was missed by people who thought that half integer quantum chains are gapped. Okay. They, uh, if, you, uh, if you just use the classical Lagrangian, it is a nonlinear sigma model. Uh, and if you use that, you would get gapped. But if you do the right uh, path integral, which was basically the work of Haldane um, uh, and Affleck, etc., they showed that you not only get this term, but you get this additional uh, topological term, which is like our S of P. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I yeah. think uh, maybe it's, uh, we should stop now. Uh, right, uh, so. Uh, okay, so uh, and one announcement is that uh, all um, this uh, your uh, lecture note has been uploaded already, but maybe if you send an updated version, we can up, uh, change that. Uh, yeah, uh, th so uh, I think that what I'll uh, do is, uh, uh, I mean, as a, every day I'll keep on sending, uh, I keep on adding the notes and uh, as I uh, add, uh, add to that, I'll try to correct the typos. Okay. Right, yeah. So maybe by the end of it, we have the entire set. Okay. okay. Uh, right. Okay. So, uh, okay. So I guess, uh, okay. So it's interesting that actually, we, I mean, in the previous week also, people have been looking at path integrals and now it's in a different perspective. So. Uh, okay, so people should work out all the steps and uh, be ready for tomorrow's <laughs> class. Uh, so thanks, and uh, let's get stuff now. Okay, thanks, thanks.